Hello, and welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. My name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds uh, for our department. Uh, now, for this academic year, uh, we decided to have a theme for Grand Rounds called Next Steps in Care, and we're having a series of presentations on innovations and updates uh, in clinical care. And there's a, a core group of us who work on Grand Rounds every week, including Samhara Braha on communications uh, and coordination, and Mike Walker uh, on technology. Um, our presentations are archived on the Grand Rounds website, uh, uh, and uh, funding for the series comes from uh, several sources, including the Ripley Fund, uh, the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions, and for several and, and from centers and institutes within the department, like with today's presentation. Uh, I'll put a link to the Grand Round speaker evaluation in the chat towards the end of the presentation. Please complete the evaluation at the end. Uh, that's helpful for me in planning Grand Rounds. Uh, now, today's Grand Rounds presentation uh, is a named lecture. Uh, today's presentation is the uh, Dr. Bruce Gage Annual Lecture in Forensic Psychiatry. Now, uh, Dr. Gage, uh, who died in April 2021, uh, had worked as Chief of Psychiatry for the Washington State Department of Corrections and Director of Forensic Services at Western State Hospital and was a Forensic Psychiatry Fellowship Director. Um, and in fact, Western State Hospital uh, had renamed what was previously called the Center of Forensic Services, now as the Bruce Gage Center of Forensic Science. And Dr. Gage had mentored and inspired many, and some say hundreds, hundreds of clinicians and professionals during his career, leaving a legacy of clinicians and other individuals committed to advancing psychiatric care for individuals with mental illness and criminal justice system involvement. And today, the Dr. Bruce Gage Annual Lecture in Forensic Psychiatry, sponsored by the UW Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Peel uh, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Peel, and I'm the director of the Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law. On behalf of the center, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Philip Resnick as this year's Bruce Gage speaker in forensic mental health. Although he needs no introduction for many of you, Dr. Resnick is a professor of psychiatry and former director of a forensic psychiatry fellowship program at Case Western University in Ohio. He is a past president of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. Dr. Resnick is an internationally known forensic psychiatrist with expertise in the assessment of violence risk, phallicide, and detection of malingered mental illness. With his expertise in forensic psychiatry, Dr. Resnick has served as a psychiatric expert witness and consultant in numerous high profile criminal cases, such as Andrea Yates, Jeffrey Dahmer, Susan Smith, Ted Kaczynski, and many others. On a personal note, I was very fortunate to train with Dr. Resnick for my fellowship training. When the center was brainstorming potential speakers to nominate for Grand Rounds, Dr. Resnick jumped right to the top of the list. I will always be grateful for the opportunity to train with him, and I am so glad that he is with all of us here today. I have no doubt that today's topic is of interest to many of you. With increased attention to the media, in the media to topics of mental illness and violence, Dr. Resnick's topic today is timely and important. His presentation is titled, School Shooters, Tormented Teens, or Cold-Blooded Killers. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Resnick. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. I appreciate the introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, work with someone uh, of your of your ability, and it was a great pleasure to have you as my fellow nine years ago. Uh, I am, I'm honored particularly to uh, have an opportunity to do this. I, I knew uh, Bruce Gage, and so I'm particularly uh, pleased that I can have uh, this opportunity uh, to talk at this particular uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, we are going to talk today about school shooters. And uh, the goals are to help people identify the characteristics of school shooters, uh, 
to talk about how to evaluate them and what type of interventions uh, may be made. The, uh, the Newtown uh, shooting at Sandy Hook was probably the most uh, emotional because it was first graders who were killed. Uh, uh, but of course, you're all aware of the number of school shootings uh, and the increase uh, that has been going on in the frequency of school uh, shootings. Uh, the uh, mass killings involving firearms in the United States occur approximately every two weeks, while school shootings occur about once a month. And I was struck by the fact that uh, 71% of adults view mass shootings as a significant stress in their life, and about a third of people actually avoid certain places, such as shopping centers, because of uh, this fear. So let's begin with what the characteristics are of school shooters. Uh, the, the best research was done by the United States Secret Service, and uh, and they are primarily virtually all by boys, although one uh, girl where there was a averted school shooting said she hoped to be the first uh, female school shooter because it would give her even more uh, publicity. And uh, revenge is the single most common motive for a school shooting, most often toward other students who may have harassed uh, or bullied the student, and occasionally toward uh, faculty uh, members. Uh, the attacks are planned. Students don't just snap. And uh, uh, the length of planning goes to as little as a couple of days to actually uh, multiple uh, years. And uh, Adam Lanza in the uh, school shooting uh, at Newtown uh, Sandy Hook actually planned it for uh, two uh, years. Uh, now, uh, other people knew about the attack in uh, over 80% of the cases, most often other students. In one case, 24 classmates and friends knew about the attacker's uh, interest in killing other children. And in one case, uh, the student shooter said he just planned to bring a gun to school to kind of look tough and other students provoked him to actually uh, in, uh, encourage him uh, to use it. Uh, sometimes an adult knows, but in the, in the studies, parents uh, do not have knowledge in advance. Now, the Columbine shooting was uh, the iconic shooting. And in shootings around the world, mass shootings, not just school shootings, people tend to look up the Columbine school shooting uh, on the web and look at details uh, of, uh, of that. Now, uh, Dylan Klebold, uh, his mother did not know about the uh, shooting in advance and was unaware of her son being depressed, even though he was writing, uh, he was actually writing uh, in a diary about how depressed he was. And this is uh, Klebold's mother. And I just want to show you just a one minute clip. You blame the parents for being out. For all the parents who have said, oh, I would have known something. I know. I would have just known. Before Columbine happened, I would have been one of those parents. <laughs> I think we like to believe that our love and our understanding is protective. And that if anything were wrong with my kids, I would know. But I didn't know. And I wasn't able to stop his hurting other people. And I wasn't able to stop his hurting himself. And uh, it's very hard to live with that. All right. Now, uh, there is no single profile of school shooters. You know, news people like to call and say, give me the profile of a school shooter. 
So in terms of prevention, focusing on behavior is much more important than trying to focus on a profile. Two thirds actually came from two parent families. Two thirds had not been in any prior trouble. And there was usually an absence of a criminal uh, record. Uh, the attackers rarely make threats directly, so you can't wait for a threat. Uh, so such things as a violent essay uh, in English class needs to be uh, looked at. Posing a threat is not the same as making a threat. Most shooters caused concern to at least one adult. So family members are very important to uh, interview. Uh, and uh, uh, virtually all 98% showed some significant uh, loss or personal failure in their life. Uh, some had a romantic relationship where they were rejected. Of course, most people don't shoot up a school with this type of rejection, but 78% actually had thought about or attempted uh, suicide. So this issue of desperation uh, coupled with a loss is of particular uh, concern. About 75% of the school shooters were bullied, uh, but you can't rely on that because non-bullied also can engage in uh, shooting. And, uh, uh, and these uh, students uh, were uh, sometimes severely persecuted, uh, tormented, and physically uh, injured. So efforts at prevention uh, certainly would include uh, reducing uh, school uh, bullying. Now, the weapon used was about 50-50 between a handgun and a rifle. 80% came from the shooter's home, uh, unlocked uh, or accessible uh, weapons uh, on the part of parents. And uh, uh, their Congress passed a gun-free school act, which required automatic expulsion and you hear the phrase zero tolerance, but that actually does not make much sense because zero tolerance suggests the, the student is, expel, ex, uh, uh, is expelled, but of course, a number of students who've been expelled have come back and shot up the school. So it makes much more sense to have a measured response uh, rather than uh, automatic uh, expulsion. Now the average school shooting is over in three minutes and the average police response time is five minutes. So the, these first responders come in, but uh, much more often than not, the school shooting is over uh, by that time. Now the goal of a student threat assessment is to intervene with students in distress before their behavior escalates to criminal uh, actions. Um, and uh, uh, in an assessment of suicide, we focus primarily on the individual who is being uh, considered, and we have some collateral information. But in assessing whether a threat will be carried out, it is primarily through collateral information, and we can't rely on the truthfulness of the individual. For example, in the recent uh, Oxford, Michigan school shooting, uh, when the student was confronted with the pictures of drawing a gun and blood, he gave the cover story that he was developing a video game and that's why he was doing that. So it's very common uh, and I've seen other cases where the student will have a cover story and you cannot accept the student's remarks at face uh, value. Now, on the internet, of course, uh, young students are going to go to the internet, and if they have a certain deviant idea, they can find other people who will agree with that idea, whether it's anti-government or white supremacy or, uh, or how schools are unfair uh, to uh, students. And, uh, and then that provides added justification for them to feel they can attack the school. Uh, because there are other malcontents 
who will reinforce their uh, hatred. And uh, there are many conspiracy theories uh, online, and this helps to disinhibit the aggression of the student. Now, before doing an evaluation as a mental health professional, uh, you want to obtain uh, complete uh, records, uh, including the online content. And one thing that clinicians are not uh, uh, as savvy about is looking, uh, as police are, is looking at the online presence. So this is very important. And uh, if necessary, the police can be involved and a search warrant can be obtained to get the student's laptop uh, and, and phone to see whether he is looking online. And uh, then online, we can see whether he is viewing weapon websites, practice uh, shooting uh, facilities, stockpiling of ammunition, or looking to purchase a gun on eBay, for example. Now, law enforcement is better at gathering that data, and we're better, of course, in our interview in looking uh, at current grievances and grudges and the student's perception that he's being unfairly treated. Uh, sometimes the students will be able to describe some unbearable uh, problem that they're struggling with, and of course, they may uh, acknowledge uh, having a recent interest in school uh, attacks. Now, of course, uh, in our interview, uh, we want to look for suicidal impulses because someone who's decided to take their life has nothing to lose by taking other lives with them and going out in, so to speak, a blaze of uh, glory. So, uh, uh, Suicidality is a very important, and this may not be evident to family members or uh, even some friends, but if they, especially if they feel desperation, say things like, I can't go on like this, and have fantasies of violence. Now, uh, it's recommended that there are threat assessment teams uh, uh, in schools at least 45% of schools now have these, and they're composed of usually a school principal, law enforcement, uh, maybe the, the uh, school resource officer, uh, mental health professional, and legal uh, counsel. Some states, such as Virginia, mandate these uh, in, uh, in uh, middle and uh, high schools. Now, in assessing a, the threat we want to look at how preoccupied the student is with the threat, uh, how uh, intent he is on carrying out it, uh, and particularly have any preparatory steps been taken. This is the single most important evidence of actual intent, preparatory uh, steps. Uh, and. Uh, especially rage and inner rage uh, coupled with immersion of, uh, of uh, violent fantasy is an especially concerning uh, combination. And the student uh, may also be isolated. And then paranoid ideas are of particular concern uh, where they have a paranoid personality. They may believe they're being persecuted, which is not the same as them actually being uh, persecuted. For example, uh, this is uh, Mr. Cho, uh, and uh, he was at Virginia uh, Tech. And uh, uh, he said, quote, you know what it feels like to be humiliated and impaled on a cross. So these shooters are very sensitive to disrespect and may feel devalued uh, by some group. And their, and their closed thinking uh, makes it hard for them uh, to get corrective uh, information. They tend to externalize uh, blame and can be actually obsessed with revenge. For example, uh, Eric Harris of Columbine said, quote, I hate you people for leaving me out of things. I will get you all back. Ultimate fucking revenge here, close quote. 
Now, with respect to bullying of the potential school shooter, you want to not just know that the person is being bullied, but understand the individual perception of the person being bullied. For example, does he feel that the whole school is supportive of his being bullied? Uh, what is his perception of how bystanders uh, feel? And does he have retaliatory uh, fantasies? Now, parental uh, uh, denial is a concern. And uh, this, of course, occurred in the Oxford, Michigan shooting where the parents uh, could not believe that their son would be a risk and of course had just purchased a gun. And what was said at that time by the school administrators was, if you don't get counseling for your son, uh, we are going to notify Child Protective Services and they have the right actually to remove a child who is a danger to self or others if the parents are not being uh, responsible. And that's exactly what was told to the parents of the uh, Oxford uh, student. Of course, the errors there were not searching the backpack and taking more immediate action in view of the uh, clues uh, which were evident. Now, uh, it's important to have an integrated approach and the goal is to reduce the student's emotional pain uh, and help the students see that they have a future, particularly since uh, there may be suicidal ideas coupled with the uh, thoughts of a school shooting, and to help show the student that uh, there is a nonviolent way for the student to solve uh, his problem, and of course develop appropriate monitoring. And sometimes the interventions are really quite easy. If a student feels picked on or unfairly treated by a particular student, a particular teacher. Uh, uh, the student can be transferred to a different class uh, of the same subject with a different teacher. Also an evaluation can be made as to whether the student needs an individualized education program and then increased uh, supervision. And uh, again, a, uh, an extreme measure would be actually filing an unruly petition order. So sometimes if parents say, we really can't control our teenage son, uh, then a juvenile court can step in and provide control uh, either through uh, in a detention home or some other setting if the parents just don't have the strength or the ability due to their own limitations to control their son. Now, I want to mention a couple of uh, cases related to my own experience. Uh, the first is uh, T.J. Lane, and uh, he uh, committed a shooting uh, in uh, Cleveland, uh, in a Cleveland suburb. He was 17 years old. He killed three students and wounded uh, two. He had a hist history of uh, hating school, uh, his parents were alcoholics and he stole alcohol and other uh, items. Uh, when I initially evaluated him, uh, he denied substance abuse to look better. And then interestingly, although only 17, he attempted to malinger uh, and malinger bad, not uh, malinger uh, good. Uh, so he said that he, uh, he later admitted to me that he made up a lie that he was sexually molested at age six, so he'd look more sympathetic to the court. He told me he had auditory hallucinations, and he later admitted he wanted to pretend to look like he was schizophrenic. He said he would make himself uh, cry to look more depressed. He took pride in manipulating the mental health staff where he was staying at a detention center, said he was pretty good at lying. My final diagnosis was a mixed personality disorder with antisocial and narcissistic uh, traits. I was employed by the defense attorneys 
but I was unable to help with an insanity defense, which is what uh, they were uh, hoping. Uh, at his trial, he remained defiant and he wore uh, an outer shirt. And then during the trial, he took off the outer shirt and he had killer that he had written uh, in magic marker on his uh, t-shirt. And then uh, in the, uh, uh, he shouted out in the courtroom with the parents of the victims there, uh, this hand that killed your sons masturbates to the memory. And then he gave uh, uh, the courtroom the finger. So uh, this did not uh, cause the judge to be particularly sympathetic, but it was already clear he was gonna be sentenced to, uh, to life uh, in uh, prison. Now, this is uh, Nicholas Cruz, uh, who engaged in the Parkland, Florida shooting on February 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, 2018. Uh, these are the 17 uh, victims uh, who were killed. Uh, they were also uh, 14 other students who were wounded. Nicholas Cruz was uh, adopted as a baby by Mr. and Mrs. Cruz. His adoptive father died when Nicholas was five. Nicholas actually uh, found him dead. And then his adoptive mother died four months before the shooting. He was already uh, over 18. And uh, so he was not uh, dependent, uh, but would be a, an adult. Uh, so he used an AR-15 rifle. And uh, these uh, rifles uh, are uh, extremely powerful. They fire 30 rounds in 10 seconds. And, uh, and Mr. Cruz waited until there was a changing of classes where he knew the hallways would be full of students. Uh, he did a lot of planning this and wrote it out in advance uh, in uh, one of his diaries. Uh, and so this allowed him to have this uh, very high uh, body count. It was actually uh, set, it was more deadly than the Columbine uh, uh, shooting. Now he had made threats to other students and uh, he uh, had been transferred multiple times had been uh, transferred out of Stoneman uh, uh, High School, uh, uh, Stoneman Douglas High School two years earlier, uh, and then uh, assaulted another student uh, and uh, was banned, for, but then allowed back in after going to special uh, school. Uh, and then uh, he still made more threats. He was not allowed to wear a backpack uh, into school because he was seen as uh, menacing. Uh, so there were many, many uh, mistakes made in this case. The FBI was warned twice and they, uh, they, they were sued and the United States government settled, uh, was awarded $125 million to the victims. The school system made many mistakes and they had a special a bill passed by the Florida legislature that provided an additional $25 million for their mistakes. And this was just a series of, uh, of errors. Now, uh, uh, Cruz's prior diagnoses included ADHD, depression, and there was uh, some evidence of autism, although it wasn't a formal uh, diagnosis uh, uh, before uh, his uh, uh, trial where he pled guilty. And although it was possible that he was gonna raise an insanity defense, he did just uh, in October uh, plead guilty and there will be a trial just for the purposes of sentencing. Uh, the prosecution is seeking a death penalty and uh, the defense attorney is hoping to have uh, uh, less than uh, a uh, death penalty. Now, this issue of uh, autism is an interesting one. Uh, the uh, Adam Lanza was clearly on the autistic spectrum. 
who did the Sandy Hook shooting. And, uh, and this is Patrick uh, Crucius, who did the El Paso Walmart uh, shooting a little more than a year ago. He was definitely uh, uh, autistic. And so the question is raised, is there a relationship between being on the spectrum and violence? And the answer is yes, but by a small margin based on the studies that are now available. People with autism have some impairment of emotional regulation and the capacity for moral reasoning. They're often isolated and they're much more likely to be bullied by peers, which then sets them up to feel uh, a need uh, for uh, revenge. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Cruz had mental health treatment, but none in the year leading up to the shooting. Uh, Cruz had many online pictures where he was proud of torturing and killing animals. Uh, the pictures included him with long knives, shotguns, and pistols. Uh, and uh, he legally purchased his AR-15. His mother accompanied him. And interestingly, the mother of Adam Lanza also accompanied him when he purchased uh, his uh, AR-15. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Cruz passed the background uh, check. Uh, there were 23 calls to the sheriff uh, in the previous decade out of concern about Cruz uh, being uh, violent. And uh, uh, Mr. Cruz put on uh, YouTube uh, a, uh, a phone uh, video uh, which said, I'm going to be the next school shooter. I am nothing. My life is meaningless. I hate everyone. So this is actually kind of a classic example where he was severely depressed. He was suicidal. He had nothing to lose. He could gain infamy uh, by doing a school uh, shooting. Now I want to show you a five-minute uh, video clip from um, the first interview done the very same day by a police detective of Cruz. And as you watch this, I want you to think about uh, whether this individual is malingering. Uh, now some of the questions that were asked by uh, the detective uh, was because of concern about whether this person truly had hallucinations. So uh, they actually uh, texted a mental health professional who said, you know, how can we get at this question of whether he is faking this or not? So the detective asked, actually asked uh, some good uh, questions. Uh, uh, which were of interest to me because I have written on this idea and identified those questions. So as you watch this, think about whether the person is faking or not. And if you think he is, I'll ask you to put into the uh, chat any evidence that you think that shows uh, malingering. You're talking about demons. What are the demons? The voices. Well, tell me about it. What are the voices about? It's, it's, one, it's another voice, the evil side. Okay. And how long has that voice been going on? Years. Okay. When did it start, you think? When your mom passed? It started getting you know, worse when my mom passed. Okay. Did it start how many years before your mom passed, do you think? When my father died. Okay. Did you ever tell anybody about the voice? Never? And what does the voice say to you? Uh, to do this, to do that. Well, what does it tell you to do? Burn, kill, destroy. So let's talk about the last couple days. When was the last time you heard the voice? Yesterday. What time was it yesterday? It was at night. Okay. And where were you at? Work. You were at work? So you had a dollar trip. And what's the voice telling you? Hurt people. 
to hurt people? Hurt people at Dollar Tree? Or hurt people? Hurt people in general. Okay. Doesn't say specifically who? Alright. So what happens? Do you hear the voice this morning or no? Hey, what, what, what's the voice saying this morning? To do it. All right. See, here's the, here's the thing. You know, and again, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get you upset. I'm not trying to ever, you know, be the nasty guy or anything. But things things that happen happen, and you know, in your mind, you have a reason why they happen, whether it's a good reason or not. It's a but reason. it's a horrible reason. You got disrespected at the school. Um, you went back to the school for whatever reason because you wanted to prove in your mind you weren't the person that Ian, what was his last name? Shingles. Or Ian Shingles beat up on campus. But this voice, you know, I understand you, you're depressed about your mom and your dad. I, that's understandable. But to accept responsibility, you can't blame a voice. Because let me ask you a question. What? I blame myself. Okay, well, okay, let's talk about because the, the voice the voice didn't tell you to take Uber, right? Yes, it did. It did? Yes. The voice said take Uber. Yes. The, the, voice, vo the voice is, is in me. You're the voice. There's, there's the in, in here. Okay, it's in your head. Yes. What is it a male voice or a female voice? Male. Male? Can you tell how old the voice is? My age. Okay. Do you have a good voice too or just a bad voice? Is there, is, there, is there a voice inside you that says, do good things? No? It's always bad. Yeah, it can't be. You held down a job for two years. If you were doing things bad, you wouldn't be able to hold a job down for two years, right? Okay. I mean, look. Everybody has... It's, everybody, it's, every, me. it's me and then my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got a quote, good and bad side. There's people... No, it's, it's, it's a voice. To, Voice in here, and it, and it is me. It's just regular me, just trying to be a person. Okay. But obviously, again, when you say it's a voice, it's you. It's all you. Wait. The voice is you as well. It's, yeah. The voice didn't force you to do anything, right? No, the voice did. It's two voices. Uh -huh. it, it, there's one half that's a good and then the bad. Yeah. Okay, well, the voice tells me to go to lunch and not pay for my meal, but I pay for my meal because I know that's the right thing to do, right? You've asked two or three times to me today that you don't deserve stuff, so you knew what was going on today was wrong, right? Then why would you want me to kill you? That's because you have remorse. So. You can't blame the voice because no. you could have stopped no, what you... There, there is a voice. I understand that, but you could have stopped from doing You knew what you were doing was wrong, right? Did you or didn't you? I don't want you to agree with me. Do you, do you believe in what you were doing? When you saw the first person go down, did you know that was wrong? So why did you keep doing it? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was you. No, it wasn't me. It was you. There was only one person there. All right. Uh, let's see uh, in the chat. Uh, all right. Uh, we have a comment that there's inconsistency. And uh, let's see. Uh, all right. He's changing response to get the right answer. Uh, most people I work with don't put much emphasis, so much emphasis on the voice. Uh, all right. Uh, he seems to be looking for a bigger reaction from the detective. All right. So uh, I think that there's two possibilities uh, here. Uh, one would be that he is actually uh, describing a phenomenon known as an inner voice. That is, let's say someone was thinking about shoplifting 
and you, part of you, you know, the internal voice says, go ahead and do it. And another part of the voice says, you better not, you might get caught. So an internal voice like that would not be a true psychotic a hallucination. So one possibility is he's describing that phenomenon. Another is that he's making this up to avoid uh, responsibility. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting that uh, the defense experts who have evaluated him uh, did not, none of them uh, uh, chose to uh, put forward a defense of not guilty by reason of insanity. So he pled guilty and he's hoping only for uh, mitigation. Uh, I, I can say that uh, in his prior records, uh, there was no evidence of uh, prior reports of violence uh, until uh, after the uh, shooting. Uh, but uh, uh, all right, let me uh, move on now. And uh, after the shooting, uh, Florida uh, was under pressure to do something. You, you may recall that the students themselves uh, led marches on the Florida legislature, as well as having a national presence. And uh, the Florida legislature allotted $400 million with the idea that they would have a school resource officer in every school, uh, door locks, bulletproof windows. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, they already had uh, school drills. It turns out that 96% of all high schools in the United States have school shooter uh, drills. And uh, some people actually raise questions about this, that these drills uh, can cause psychological harm and spook students uh, considering uh, the infrequency of actual uh, school shootings. Uh, they also became a red flag uh, state. And uh, this uh, now uh, 19 states have become red flag states, which means that uh, a, uh, a police officer can go before a judge and get permission to remove a gun uh, physically. Uh, those are called gun violence restraining orders or extreme risk protection orders. And they do not require mental illness, only evidence of uh, dangerousness. Now, another study was recently completed by the uh, Secret Service, and it looked at thwarted mass uh, homicides. And the, uh, it turns out that uh, it was family and friends, or even the general public who would tip off the police. In one case, a grandmother discovered her grandson uh, had weapons uh, and a diary and uh, reported him to the police. And 40% of these individuals wanted to outdo infamous shootings like Virginia Tech or uh, Columbine. Now, George Bernard Shaw uh, made the observation that martyrdom is the only way in which a man can become famous without ability. Uh, now, that, that's a pretty astute observation. But as wise as George Bernard Shaw was, he could not see into the future. And it turns out that uh, some celebrities can become famous uh, without uh, ability. Uh, let me comment now on prevention of school shootings. Other students are absolutely critical because they are more likely to know than anyone else before a school shooting occurs. So it's important to set a tone so that students are comfortable reporting. And some states have uh, actually an app where people can anonymously report any concerns. And uh, uh, so students must be comfortable breaking a code of uh, silence. And uh, in a recent uh, 
case that occurred in Spokane, Washington, there was a school shooting and uh, the shooter gave two girls a note uh, the day before or a few days before the shooting and said, uh, if, uh, if I'm not, if I'm dead or in jail, don't feel this is your fault. These were girls that he knew well and didn't want them to feel guilty. Fortunately, both of them turned their notes into the school principal. The student was suspended from school and did have a referral to a mental health professional. Um, unfortunately, he denied uh, and again gave a cover story uh, that it, uh, it had to do with just uh, thinking about suicide. He would not harm anyone else. And uh, uh, the therapist suggested that the parents uh, search their son's room and look for what his internet presence was, but they didn't get around to it on time. And so the school shooter did go ahead and, uh, and kill uh, students and wound uh, others. And again, there's a lawsuit involved uh, in uh, that uh, case. So to uh, summarize, you want to, uh, the most important thing I think here is assessing the online presence of the potential school shooter. And for example, in the Aurora, Colorado movie shooting, uh, they suspected uh, that uh, Mr. Holmes was a danger, but he kept denying it. And uh, even though they breached confidentiality and reached out to his mother, what they never did was look at his uh, uh, computer or phone, which would have shown that he was stockpiling uh, ammunition and uh, practicing shooting. Uh, and uh, inner rage uh, coupled with increasing immersion in violent fantasies are of particular uh, concern. And then with respect to prevention, again, this idea of seeing something and saying something uh, and getting that across to other students is the most uh, important. All right, I wanted to leave uh, time for questions. So if you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat, uh, uh, we'll have, uh, uh, Joseph, are you going to uh, relate those to me? Yes, or is I, I, I will do that. And I'll invite uh, Dr. Peel to, to join us as well. Okay. Uh, okay, well, thank you, Dr. Resnick. Uh, for for going through this presentation, what 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 a what what a range from from uh, direct observations of individuals, synthesis of recent literature, your own uh, experiences as an expert uh, as well. Um, a new question just came in, Dr. Resnick. It looks like the first question here about uh, your thoughts, uh, opinions, uh, impressions so far about the the parents of of of, of the. the um, individual at Oxford, uh, Oxford School getting charged with manslaughter? Well, what I can say about that is uh, of 178 school shootings, on only five occasions have parents actually been charged with uh, failing to keep their guns secure. Some states have laws which require this, and so it is easy to charge the parents at least with failing to secure the gun. Uh, what happened in Oxford, Michigan, of course, is actually charging them with involuntary manslaughter, a much more serious charge, and the prosecutor described their conduct actually as uh, egregious in not cooperating with school authorities, and uh, they knew that they had purchased a gun. The school authorities did not know that. However, that raises a question as to whether if the school authorities had done the best possible work uh, they would have searched the backpack and asked about uh, any guns uh, in the home. 
So I think uh, in retrospect, uh, uh, there were things that were overlooked, which of course is so much easier in retrospect. Um, I don't, you know, when one's son kills other people, uh, and this is nicely reflected by uh, the, uh, uh, the Dylan Klebold mother, uh, uh, you become a pariah and not only all the families who were victimized, but the whole school turns against the parents. So a big price is paid to be the parents of a school shooter, uh, even if you don't have a criminal penalty yourself. It's not like you get away with anything. Uh, but if it would give the message to parents that they are responsible for securing their gun, that would be uh, important. Uh, it turns out that there's one study that when there are suicidal adolescent boys, if there is a gun in the home, they are 10 times more likely to commit suicide. And in one study which did a follow-up, when parents were told to secure the gun, to put the gun in a safe or get it out of the home, only one third of the parents of suicidal teens did so. So it seems evident that parents somehow uh, minimize, they can't uh, really accept that their son would kill themselves or someone else. And, and uh, so some message about how important this is, uh, I think would be important to convey. Whether it ought to be conveyed through this Michigan case or not, I think is open. Thank you, Dr. Resnick. Uh, a question, maybe more on the clinical side, about um, maybe the, the phenomenology of violent fantasies. What are some possible explanations for, for this? What, what have you seen? Well, uh, there are some individuals who develop violent fantasies. Again, in the Holmes uh, Aurora school shooting, it, uh, that individual actually developed violent fantasies at age 10 and never, uh, they were never resolved. From age 10 on, he had violent fantasies. And as a child, his fantasies were to uh, like set off an atomic bomb or uh, do something else that was unrealistic. And then uh, when he eventually did carry out these uh, uh, you know, he actually had experience as an usher in a movie theater and he knew his way around movie theaters and decided to carry out his violent fantasies there. The, uh, the Unabomber, uh, he uh, developed his first violent fantasies when he was 17 after an experience. He was, uh, uh, actually it was before 17, he was 15. He was a, a a high school junior and he had skipped grades and he was already isolated. So he was sitting alone at a cafeteria table and there were six boys and girls sitting at a table next to him. And one guy said to a gal, are you going to the dance Saturday night? And the gal said, yes. And the guy said, who are you going with? And the gal said, Ted. And the guy said, you're going with Ted Kaczynski to the dance? And the girl said, don't be ridiculous. I'm going with Ted so-and-so. So when Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, overheard that and realized how he was so socially isolated and at the bottom of a social, uh, of a totem pole, he said that was the first time he thought about getting revenge against a rejecting society uh, with that uh, slight. So uh, I have seen individuals who have not carried out any violence, uh, but they have violent fantasies uh, repeatedly. So they, they need to be taken seriously. And uh, there is one study that shows violent fantasies among people with prior criminal conduct uh, is more likely to be carried out if someone has violent fantasies without uh, prior conduct. Uh, the chances go down, but nonetheless, they need to be uh, seriously uh, evaluated. Uh, 
a question came in about video about video games. You know, you hear a lot about the shooting type games. What what is there research evidence on this as a contributing factor? What what, what are your thoughts? There is research evidence that shows people who uh, uh, commit violence uh, look at violent video games more than other people. So there is a correlation, but there is no study which shows causation. There's no study that shows uh, that people who watch uh, video, uh, violent video games, first person shooter games are actually more likely to carry out the uh, violence. Um, so there's a, 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 a complicated question. Uh, uh, I recognize there's a couple of minutes. Your uh, maybe initial thoughts about uh, the number of school shootings in the United States relative to other countries and just how, how unique of an, of an occurrence it is. Um, what are, um, the question is uh, maybe related more sort of explanations for, for this occurrence in the United States and not other countries. Um, there's perhaps a lot to say about that, but I'll pose the question as it was asked. Okay, sure. Uh, it's absolutely true that most of school shootings, uh, far more than any other country, occur in the United States. Uh, and uh, again, in uh, the access to uh, fatal weapons, guns, uh, are a critical issue. In Japan, you are literally more likely to be die from being struck by lightning than killed by gunshots. Uh, and uh, and access to weapons is uh, very widespread in the US, much more so than Canada, even though Canada has lots of hunting, uh, but you don't have the widespread uh, access uh, to weapons. Uh, and uh, I think you have the copycat phenomenon, and there is one study which showed that within two to three weeks after a shooting, there are, there's more likely to be other shootings than, uh, than other times of the year. So I think that because they occur in the US, you have both the copycat and the access to weapons, I think are two of the, the factors that would go into it. Um, another question came in about the explanations for why, why school, school shooters are, are male. Why, why, why is that? Well, first of all, uh, there's a relationship between testosterone and violence very broadly. Violence is committed by men 10 times more often than women, uh, except among the severely mentally ill. And adolescent males are the most likely to commit uh, violence and they develop better controls uh, as they are get toward their mid twenties. That's why of course, uh, the insurance for male drivers is there uh, so that there's no question that young males uh, uh, have this greater propensity for violence. And uh, there is you know, a very small number of uh, women who have of female students now, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's really, it's not surprising at all that, uh, that males would be doing this. Uh, uh, they are more likely when, uh, when there is a, uh, an insult, uh, a male or a threat, a male is more likely to respond with violence. Females may respond with violence, but they're more likely to tend and befriend and try and uh, reach out to get someone who will protect them uh, than to exercise violence as a firsthand uh, response. Thank you for that response, Dr. Resnick. Uh, Dr. Peel, in, in the final minute, uh, 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 I'd like to offer you the, an opportunity to have a comment if, if you'd like. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank Dr. Resnick for being with us today. What a timely and interesting um, presentation. I think we all learned a lot and we would welcome you back anytime. Thank you so much for your excellent talk. My pleasure, Ben. Well, thank you, Dr. Resnick. And thank you uh, to Dr. Peel and the Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law for sponsoring today's uh, 
annual lecture, the annual uh, Dr. Bruce Gage annual lecture. Um, and we'll end grand rounds uh, there. Thank you.